Talking about being alone, uh, obviously you yourself also have, I think, uh, a lot of your loved ones and family maybe far away from here yeah. uh, in Colombia. Yeah. How, how do you deal yourself with this? Well, I think I speak more frequently. So I'm, all my family is there, my mother is there, my brother is there, aunts, uncles, I'm the only one here. Um, I speak with, with especially my mother, my brother, more frequently than I would have done. And I have learned to uh, let go um, because I cannot do much besides saying, I will speak to you, you need something, you need to tell me. Um, but I cannot change the situation. I cannot really understand what they are living through because the situation in Colombia is quite different from the situation here in terms of poverty, in terms of people living from an informal economy, in terms of people going to the streets still with the epidemic because if they don't go to the streets, they cannot eat. They need, that is how they get the money to eat. So you cannot just tell them be at home. And in the, in the middle of all the people going to the streets and do things, then it's, it's also my 75-year-old mother who has to go to do shopping and, and the streets are completely full of people. And um, what can you say, don't go out? That's, that's, you have to let go, you, you have to accept um, that, that you have no influence or knowledge in the situation and, and, and you have to accept it. In theory, everybody knows how to live a happy and healthy life. <laughs> I don't like the word happy that much. I, I, I like the word a fulfilled life. I, I think happy is something that goes and on. You know, it's, it's, it's like the peaks in the mountains, but you don't always stay in the peak. Um, so happy is for me moments, and, and fulfillment is a more permanent state, and fulfillment doesn't require you to be happy the whole time. But if you talk about fulfillment, I think one of the terms that comes to mind is purpose. Yeah. Um, how, how do you find such a thing, which is not easy to find, maybe? Or is it? No, but you have to recognize why are you doing things for? Uh, I think that's, 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 that's part. What part, and you have, what part is selfish, and it has to be a selfish part. I'm, I'm, and I think that also comes with a little bit the sense of responsibility. I do believe everyone has, and, and maybe my husband always says a little bit the Calvinistic <laughs> part for a Colombian, but I, I do think you have a responsibility to do with the gifts you get. So, um, and it doesn't have to be big and transforming, but have to go beyond yourself. You know, and I think at the university we have the benefit of this combination between research of a, of a big problem, so there's purpose in there, but also education and coaching. Uh, where there is purpose on that as well. Um, so I think in that sense, for me, university combines like the two things, like the big thing that you will try to achieve and you really believe we need to change the way we produce things and how we can arrive to that. And then the coaching and the coaching your students and the coaching people around you and, and and the big coach and they learn from them. So it's not a one-way relation where you realize I learn from them. How did you find your own purpose? How did I find what? Sorry? Your own purpose. My own purpose. I don't know. It is a difficult question. When did I, I think it's, it's something that happens gradual and changes. It, it does changes as you grow older. And do you realize that there is, no, at least for me, no, it's not the, the purpose, but it's the purpose that fulfills me at this stage in my life? And it's perfectly okay if it will be something else in five years. And it was perfectly okay that it would not have been the same when I was 20. There must be a lot of pressure. How, how do you deal yourself with pressure? You know, pressure, good pressure, does produce some adrenaline, so I'm... I'm a person who doesn't drink, I don't smoke, I, in that sense I'm, I'm very healthy, but I do have a little thing for, for the stress and, and the pressure and, and the produce. So I think that helps. By, by character I like it, and I think that's, 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 that's where you look. I, I think it's, it's um, one way of managing pressure, of course, in, in, when you are working with a lot of people, is to try to recognize exactly what are you 
contributing in the group and what are other people giving you as well. So it's a more a team effort that if you are just <laughs> trying to solve the problem with a magic bar and thinking you are the one, well, why? I mean, I'm special, but not that special. <laughs> um, it's a team. It's a team and I don't mind you know, who gets what I produce and, and I work with people who, who are very generous with the knowledge. So that I think that that helps. Infobesity is the most widespread common disease. What, what we see right now is, is not getting the information where the bottleneck. So if I look when I started doing research at the university many years ago, Getting the information was the bottleneck, especially if you were on no internet, uh, you know, just journals, in the, physically in the library, through the pages of the book. and That's not the problem anymore. The problem is to understand, A, what is exactly what you are looking for? What is your question? Because you don't have that clear, you're going to swim in information. When do you know enough? When do you start? stop gathering new information and you think you have enough knowledge that will allow you to make a conclusion. It doesn't mean to be the conclusion, but uh, uh, something that you notice sometimes is that if you keep just looking for new information, you're never going to stop. You never. It, it's impossible. But there's a point where the new information is just adding a little bit to the basis. And that's the moment you say, okay, I have enough. Um, when, and what to do with the information? Um, and it's easy then to commit plagiat, and it's easy to don't give, you know, uh, to tell people this is yours and this is yours, and pff, I just go into Google, copy C, you know, control C, control V, I can copy this picture and put this sentence and put this other one and put it together and it's mine. Well, really? Um, so, I think it's a problem not only because of the amount, but because of, of uh, sometimes the lack of understanding of how difficult it is to produce that information and therefore you are very willing to go and take some other people work um, very easily. How do you see that in daily practice? What requires it from people uh, at university at the moment? I think interdisciplinary work requires several things. It requires you to be open and that's a, an, an open in many sense, including sharing your information. And that is a difficult thing to do because a lot of the work we do is in the, in the breaking of the frontier. Am I the first one that has been developing this? Am I, is, this is my contribution to science. And if you work and you share your information, then there's a high level of trust that the other person is going to receive that information, but it's not going to run away and publish them under their own name. Okay, that, that, that's a very clear uh, answer here. Um, maybe as a last question, you were talking about reading. What is the most beautiful book you ever read? There is a classical book that a lot of people say, oh yeah, of course, the typical Colombian you know, Cien Años de Soledad, 100 Years of Loneliness, of Solitude, and I think it's the... I, I found the way he, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez wrote that book. I, it's just, I have read it 30 times. Every time I read it through life, I see things in a different way. My name is Andrea Ramirez. I am a full professor on low carbon systems and technologies at TPM. I'm a chemical engineer by background, but I do system analysis. I'm director of the Graduate School of TPM. Um, that's it. <laughs>